Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here at the end of what seems like a pretty full-on week. Anybody here feeling a bit tired? Me too, yeah. But we'll, we can do this. We can, we can do this. So my name's Liz Rice. I'm the Chief Open Source Officer at Isovalent. Isovalent is the company that originally created Cilium. And today I'm going to give a tour of the Cilium service mesh. Now, I joined Isovalent a bit over a year ago, and I joined because I am fascinated by eBPF. eBPF is the technology that Cilium uses. Uh, this talk is not particularly about eBPF, um, but uh, certainly Isovalent has a ton of expertise in that area. And when I first joined the company, Thomas Graff, who I'm sure many of you know, uh, explained to me that, well, Selim already is kind of 80% of a service mesh. So today I'm going to explain why he was saying that, why it's actually not such a big leap from Selim as a CNI to Selim as a service mesh, show you some of the features, just a, a little tiny dip into what we have today in service mesh, and talk a bit about where we're going next and what still needs to be done. So how many of you here are already using Cilium? Quite a few of you. Do I have anyone here who was part of the Cilium service mesh beta? I see a hand back there, so thank you very much. Oh, a couple of hands, yeah, awesome. So when we, uh, I don't know why that, thing's, <laughs> yeah. so when we announced the Cilium Service Mesh beta program. And uh, our artist, Vadim, came up with this nice little uh, bit of artwork about getting rid of sidecars. And I think some of that has been a little bit controversial. So I hope I'm going to explain today why we're preferring a model that doesn't use sidecars and some of the advantages that that gives us and how we've been able to get there. So Cilium as a CNI, it's based on eBPF that I mentioned. It's a very high performance network plug plugin for Kubernetes. You can also use it standalone, but I think the majority of users are using it in a Kubernetes environment. It implements connectivity. What else is networking for than to connect our workloads to each other and to the outside world? Uh, it implements security features. We have network policy. We have network layer encryption. And it provides load balancing, whether that's as a cube proxy replacement, so load balancing between the different pods that make up a service, or also as a standalone load balancer. There's also a component called Hubble, which gives us visibility into network flows. So we can get detailed flow logs of every network packet. And from that, the Hubble UI can show you a service map showing which services are communicating with each other. We get lots of metrics that we can export to Prometheus and produce Grafana dashboards. We'll see a few of those in a moment. And we get visibility into the layer three, four, and layer seven traffic, so layer seven being the application level protocols. Okay, let's just step back a minute and talk about the history of service mesh. So before it was even called service mesh, applications that are potentially written in different programming languages needed to communicate with each other. They might be sending HTTP messages between themselves or gRPC or whatever protocol. And perhaps they're implementing uh, TLS uh, for security. And each application back in the day would need to import its own library to implement those networking functions. And if you wanted to do the things that we associate with service mesh today, like canary rollout or retries or rate limiting, well, good luck, that's going to be a significant amount of work to implement in all of your different applications. So 
we move to the sidecar model. Now, Kubernetes allows us to group containers into pods. Pods share a network name, or all the containers in a pod share the same network namespace. So that allows us to have a proxy called a sidecar inside the pod with the application container providing the service mesh functionality. So for example, your application doesn't need to worry about setting up TLS, you can leave that to the proxy to take care of. You can leave service discovery, you can leave retries, you can leave all the load balancing up to the sidecar proxy and it makes life far easier for the developer. So this is, this is great, this is much more efficient from a development perspective. And also because containers are containers, you don't have to have the same programming language. Those sidecar proxies can be, uh, come from a third party, and indeed many of them do. A lot of, uh, a lot of people are using Envoy, for example. There's also Linkerd. The proxy can be the same in every application pod, regardless of the language of that application. So the question comes to mind, can we take this service mesh functionality that started in the application and then moved into the pod, could we bring it into the kernel? Why would we want to do that? Well, networking stacks used to, back in the day, when all of us were very small children, <laughs> networking stacks used to be written in the application. You'd have to write your TCP IP probably as a, lang uh, a library, but you'd have to have that in user space. Now we all expect our networking stack to be taken care of by the kernel. If we think of Kubernetes as a distributed operating system, service mesh is really the equivalent of the networking stack. Could we pull that into the kernel today? And the answer is mostly, not quite everything yet, but mostly. Layer seven is the part that we don't really have today. It will come, but we don't have that right now, this moment. But all of the layer four functionality and beneath is already being handled. We've seen that in Cilium. Cilium handles layer three, four traffic, provides load balancing, provides security, provides observability. And yet, Cilium already has visibility into layer seven. Let's, uh, actually I'll skip to the demo first to show you what I mean about layer seven visibility. So, is that big enough to see at the back? Is that okay? Somebody wave if you can see. Yeah, I see some thumbs, good. Um, right, so what do I have in this namespace far, far away? Come on, network, there we go. Okay, I have an X-Wing, a TIE Fighter, and a couple of Death Stars. And my, let's suppose my TIE Fighter wants to land on the Death Star. Well, first of all, I'm gonna start off some observability. I'm gonna run Hubble to watch traffic in that far, far away namespace. And if I exec into my TIE Fighter, and uh, actually I'll find a previous, previous one of these, that'll be easier. Uh, let's not do that one yet. Okay, so I could request from a TIE Fighter that I want to land on the Death Star, and that's okay, I'm allowed to do that. In fact, I could uh, find out all sorts of oops, find out all sorts of, all sorts of things from this, the Death Star uh, API. Let's see what's available from the Death Star API. Yeah, there's all sorts of things I can do with this API. It's good to see the uh, Empire has adopted cloud native. So I don't know if you've been noticing these flows going up in the top half of the screen, but we have. Things like this, where we've got visibility into the HTTP request. This is layer seven, and we can see the URL, the path that's been requested, and we can see the response here. In, in this example, it was a, a 200. 
So we're getting all this visibility into the traffic flowing within the namespace far, far away. And we can also at layer seven provide security with uh, network policies. So suppose I'm the uh, security officer on the Death Star and I probably don't want people putting things into the exhaust port. This looks a little bit dangerous. Uh, we can just see what happens if, if, that ha if we do that. I think I've got an example of that from back here. Yeah. Yeah, that's a bad day on the Death Star. So if we want to prevent that from happening, we can use a layer seven network policy to do that. And I have one already prepared. So this is uh, going to match uh, at layer three, four, it's going to match uh, endpoints. No, it's going to match endpoints in the empire, in the Death Star. And this is what it applies to. And it's going to police ingress traffic. We're only going to allow traffic from other empire organizations. No landing from the Rebel Alliance, please. And we are only going to allow TIE fighters and other Empire equipment to post to request landing. Everything else is not going to be permitted. I've also got, uh, this will come into effect later on, I'm going to allow external traffic from world um, outside of the cluster will also only be allowed to post to request landing. So if I apply that rule, uh, layer seven rule, I think. And that will create a Cilium network policy that should prevent the exhaust port from having anything put into it. Okay. And we can see, let's just scroll off the screen, we can see that Hubble was able to see that level seven request again, and we can see that it was dropped, it was out of policy. And if I take a look in my uh, Grafana dashboards, we can see uh, information about when uh, requests have been placed. We can see things like latency. We can see uh, DNS requests and responses and so on. All of this has been generated by Hubble and Cilium metrics. So we get a lot of visibility into what's happening. So we've got that layer seven visibility that we need for service mesh. How did we achieve that? We achieved that by having an Envoy proxy. So built into Cilium, we use Envoy. Cilium is using eBPF to dynamically program the kernel with network endpoints and connections between them. And whenever it needs to terminate layer seven, be that for policy, be that for visibility, it's using Envoy for that. So if we want to implement a service mesh, what do we need? We need observability. This is actually a graph of what our service mesh beta users asked us they wanted to see from service mesh features. By far, the most popular feature was observability. We already have that. People are very interested in Kubernetes ingress. They're very interested in being able to do those kind of traffic management features like canary rollouts or circuit breaking or rate limiting. They're very interested in encrypting the traffic between services. We tend to assume that's going to be MTLS, but let's hold that thought. We are interested in authenticating services to each other, and we're interested in encrypting the traffic. But we've split those two ideas out for a reason. So people wanted to see observability. They want to see ingress, which is going to require load balancing traffic that comes from outside the cluster and sending it to the right backend services. And in order to do that, we're going to have to be able to parse layer seven protocols so that we can you do path-based routing or routing, depending on where you're from in the world. Uh, 
we need to be able to have those more detailed rules that we anticipate with service mesh, so to be able to load balance traffic to different pods within a service based on perhaps what version they are. And we want identity-based security. Something I didn't point out, but you probably noticed in the uh, Hubble flows, is we can see the identities of the Kubernetes services that are involved. We can see the namespace, we can see the service, we can get all the details about which pods are sending and receiving traffic, because Cilium understands the Kubernetes identities. So a whole bunch of this functionality already existed in Cilium before we did anything to call it a service mesh. And I think that's what Thomas meant when he said, it's already basically an 80% service mesh. So we have had to do some additional work and that is essentially to say, we're not just going to use Envoy for the policies and observability, but we're also going to start programming Envoy listeners to implement those different rules. All those traffic management functionality that we associate with service mesh is implemented in Envoy, and we're going to have Cilium program those listeners through a CRD that we call Cilium Envoy Config, programming that in user space and programming eBPF for the network traffic, traffic within the kernel. So let's have a little look at ingress. I have an ingress for the Death Star so that not only can we have traffic within the cluster, but we can also allow TIE fighters who may have been somewhere else in the universe to land on the Death Star. So, oh, let's have a look at what that's created. That has created uh, Cilium Envoy config. This was automatically generated by the creation of the, by the definition of the ingress. So let's have a little look at what the Cilium Envoy config looks like. So this has a listener, the, the name of which was automatically generated. Um, and this is going to route traffic that comes from outside the cluster to request landing and it will route it to the Death Star service. Uh, I can also show you that the ingress created the service automatically here. So this load balancer matches the ingress that I just showed you. So this very complicated address we're gonna need and I should be able to curl, let's post to request a landing. And the ship can land from outside the cluster. That was only permissible because my, I still have my network policy in place and I allowed for external traffic as well as internal Empire Mark traffic to be allowed to reach that destination, but I can't do things like uh, put to oops, the exhaust port. Let's hope not, because we don't want anybody blowing up the Death Star. Yeah, that's not going to get there. In fact, that has been dropped by the ingress, so we never even saw the traffic here. And again, we're going to see the, uh, the Grafana visibility or Grafana dashboard showing us uh, things like the, the latency of these requests. Um, we can see uh, when things get dropped, why they get dropped. So we should see somewhere some, yeah, traffic being dropped because it was out of policy and so on. Okay. Yeah. 
And I showed you the underlying Cilium Envoy config that programs the Envoy listeners. Now, those are pretty low level, it's a pretty low level CRD. And although if you take a look at the service mesh examples that we've created, there are some examples of traffic management where you, you would uh, manually program those Cilium Envoy configs. But that's not really the end game. The end game is more akin to what we've done with Kubernetes ingress, where by defining the ingress, there's an operator that automatically creates the corresponding Cilium Envoy config. So we will, uh, as I'll come to later, we will have other abstractions for configuring Cilium Envoy configs for the other features that you expect from Service Mesh. We had beta testers telling us why they like this model. We asked for comments on why people were interested. And this was a very typical comment. People who've tried using Service Mesh and have found either the performance or the complexity of the service of the sidecar model problematic. Um, so I have a few examples of, of user comments about this. It's not just the overhead, it's also the management complexity that people found challenging. And the idea of not having to manage such a complex set of resources, people find very attractive. It's another example. Having a sidecarless service mesh with a CNI sounds like a perfect solution. If we looked at the sort of summary of those surveys, and, I, and I've linked to this in the presentation, which I haven't yet uploaded, but will shortly, you'll find the, the survey data where a lot of people mention the operational complexity of service mesh. They mention the resource consumption of service mesh. They're looking for better performance. And they've also had problems with the startup of sidecar containers where you, you've got perhaps init containers, you've got your proxy, you've got your application containers that all need to start within a pod and can cause race conditions or otherwise uh, have issues in the order in which those containers come up. Talked about reducing resources. If every application pod includes a sidecar, and that sidecar has a bunch of routing table information, for example, if you have to duplicate that for every single application pod, that can be a significant amount of resources. If we only need one instance of that routing information per node, that's a significant reduction. And we're also making the network path, so the the route that network packets need to take within the machine, making that much more efficient. This is an example of how a network packet needs to flow from an application through the networking stack in the pod to reach the service mesh proxy. And then from there, it needs to exit the pod through the networking stack to get to the host's networking stack, which it then needs to traverse to get out of the physical machine. With eBPF, we can connect the socket layer from the application essentially directly to the networking endpoint, to the, the network card, the network interface. And if we don't, many packets do not need to be routed through the proxy. We only need to route packets through the proxy when we need to get at that layer seven information. So lots of packets can go straight through eBPF to the network interface. But when we need to, we can route things to Envoy for layer seven termination as necessary. And that does give us the performance improvements that you might expect. You still have a proxy on the node but you don't have to have two proxies if you want to go from one service to another service on the same node. There's a really great blog post that Thomas wrote that uh, explores this in more detail. 
We've also published the, the details and the scripts of how we've made these performance measurements. We would love for other people to go out and replicate them and tell us if we've made mistakes, because um, it's obviously important that we get this right. But I think it does um, it intuitively make sense that if you're not having to go through such a long network path, you will have better latency. And the throughput is pretty similar, marginally better from what we tested, but uh, pretty similar. One thing that was dramatically improved was pod startup time. Don't have to wait for the proxy to become ready as well as your application. That can make a very significant difference. So I talked a bit about the Cilium Envoy config being a kind of low-level uh, abstraction. There are many ways of configuring a service mesh today, whether you're using Istio or Linkerd or service mesh interface. And what we've done with Cilium service mesh so far is really about making that data plane much more efficient. How we program that data plane, how we program those Envoy rules, well, we're pretty agnostic to what the right control plane abstraction is. Whatever is the right control plane abstraction for you can be integrated. It's just a case of providing that mapping between the service mesh, uh, I want to say service mesh interface, but I mean any of those uh, abstractions, how their control plane configures those um, those abstractions and mapping those to the underlying Cilium Envoy configs. So there's some work to be done. And if you want to get involved in contributing uh, the integrations between these interfaces and the programming of the CEC, that is work that needs to be done in the project. Uh, as an example, what you saw with the Kubernetes ingress there is an operator that is uh, taking that ingress information and programming the underlying CEC. So that's an example. There will be more. So there's one piece of the puzzle missing. We've seen connectivity. We've talked about how we can program the Envoy proxy. We've talked about uh, visibility. We have not talked about MTLS much. The plan that we have here is to separate the authentication part from the encryption part. And the reason why we want to do this is because we already have very efficient network layer encryption, be that IPsec or WireGuard. The encryption can happen within the kernel. But we need to get the um, certificates injected into the kernel in order to um, uh, to perform that encryption, and we need to validate those um, or authenticate those certificates, or authenticate those identities when we're setting up a network connection. So, on the roadmap intended for the next, so 1.13 release, will be this separation of authentication in the user space layer and using that to control. Uh, network layer encryption. Again, we're pretty agnostic to where those certificates come from. It could be Spiffy, it could be Cert Manager. There is work to be done here to integrate those with the authentication layer. But we see this as the future of providing those encrypted connections between services. And again, there's more detail in a blog post on the ISO valence side. So pretty much to sum up, the intention here with Cilium Service Mesh is that we can produce the most efficient data path in much the same way that Cilium uses eBPF to provide a much more efficient data path than IP tables based networking solutions. We're extending that even further to Service Mesh, but we're still using Envoy where layer seven termination is required. By using eBPF, we're getting much faster performance, almost as fast as just pure node-to-node no -node network performance. 
and we can support any protocol. There is work to be done to bring the control plane of your choice to make it easy to configure the service mesh. And there is work to be done to bring the certificate management of your choice to encrypt the traffic. The observability integrations are essentially already there. So we can export those metrics. We have all that flow log data, all that uh, telemetry goodness already there. And this makes Service Mesh part of the Cilium family of very efficient networking, observability, and um, security enforcement. So I hope that's explained something of how we've gone from Cilium as a network interface to Cilium as a service mesh. And uh, if you want to find out more, the Cilium website, the Cilium project on GitHub, um, Cilium on Twitter. We have an amazingly um, active Slack channel, which you'll find linked from the Cilium site. And also, there is, if you have any enthusiasm for, um, actually, I'm not sure if the uh, expo is still open, so it may be too late to say go and pick up a book, but you can get the PDFs of these two books that we've recently written from the Isovalent website, if you're interested in learning more about eBPF or about security observability, written by my colleague Natalia and Jed. Uh, so with that, I think you almost at the end of the day, I think maybe there's one more session to go. So well done for maintaining stamina for this long. Very much appreciate that you took the time to come here at the end of the week. And uh, yeah, if, I don't know if we have like a minute for questions. So uh, yeah, if we have questions, let's do it. Thank you very much. I think there's some microphone action going on. <laughs> yes. Hi, there's uh, one question from people who are uh, virtual at the conference. So they ask about your opinion about uh, gRPC proxyless service mesh, and do you see a different goal for, for that approach? Um, so we've already got examples of gRPC, certainly for ingress, uh, it, it's essentially the same. We, we're agnostic to the protocol. Any other questions? The mic is there. So you didn't really move the data plane into the kernel, like Envoy is still running in the, in the user mode. Is there some thinking around moving it into the kernel? I think ultimately that, that will be the future, yes. And um, we already have some layer seven passing being done in eBPF. I, I'm going to say more experimentally than in production, but so for example, we do have a, an HTTP2 parser that runs in eBPF. So I do expect that eventually it will be possible to run the protocol parsing parts in the kernel. Yeah. Hi, Liz. Uh, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about the trade offs that there are of going from a you know, per pod security context? where Linux isolation features are being like per proxy in the sidecar mm -hmm. uh, to uh, trusting a, a single host proxy to work with multiple workloads. Yeah, so this is, I think, quite uh, you know, There are various different schools of thought on this. And I don't think you know, we've completely got to the bottom of every possible you know, uh, argument here. Um, I would say. We have in the kernel namespaces and C groups that we use to isolate network stacks already. We don't worry about the fact that we're running pods using a shared kernel to run our network stack up to layer four anyway. So now what we're doing by running this in Envoy, obviously this is user space rather than in the kernel, but we're using that listener concept as a, uh, a kind of isolation process. Now, I would say if you're you know, in a high security, you know, you're very worried about the, um, 
the multi-tenant situation, perhaps you don't want to run those different tenants on the same node. But I don't think that, you know, I think it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, whether that's important. I've also heard people talking about, worrying about like the um, uh, potential for sort of interference, noisy neighbors, um, you know, the, the resource constraints that are implemented using C groups in the kernel, but you know, if we're in Envoy, how are we doing that? Definitely room for research there, but I would say if we're going to end up saving 40% of your resources, then perhaps that's you know, going to solve the problem anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's always trade-offs, right? Absolutely, Thinking absolutely. About the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the, like, it's like C++ implemented parsers, right? And then it's like you have like user data like flowing through it. So yeah, makes sense. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi, Liz. Hi. It took us uh, more than a year to migrate uh, more than 3,000 pods to a steel-based uh, service mesh for us. I'm not sure if we want to do another migration. What would, uh, what is the, what would you recommend the easiest uh, migration path from a steel to a uh, silium service oh, mesh? That, that is a great question. I think it, I mean, first of all, it is pretty early days. I mean, we're we're in the, the closing stages of, of the first release that will have ingress in GA. So um, we don't have like a whole load of experience of people migrating yet. Um, if there is a significant group of users who really want to take those Istio CRDs and, and keep those in place, but use those to program Envoy, you know, th that could be one of the um, one of the options, you know, uh, at the moment we've seen a lot more interest in doing uh, SMI uh, and also in doing annotations to Kubernetes. But I think if there is interest from the community, then making it easy to migrate from Istio could really involve just taking those existing Istio CRDs and having the integration to use that to program CECs. Right. You can't do that today, but. I think that will be right. Thank you so much. Hi, great talk. Uh, this is Aitor. Uh, I'm interested in, uh, do you think it, the tooling, I mean, if everything goes well, this is great, but if things go sideways, like you're turning to debugging the kernel, basically, which is a whole different story than working on user space. So, how's. So, I don't think it's different from what we already have in networking in the kernel with Cilium. And we have some great tools for observing that. You know, we, Hubble gives us a lot of visibility into where there are various different hooks where we're hooking eBPF programs. We can use that to get visibility. There's a lot of um, uh, you know, debug information that gets generated by Cilium when needed. We have a ton of metrics. I don't now how that um, maps to sort of what's happening in the Envoy space. I'm sure there will be learnings and maybe there will need to be more tools. But I don't think the fact that it's moving to or that you might be moving to a kernel based networking layer. People love Hubble for debugging networking issues. And we have some users who really run at massive scale. We had Datadog yesterday talking about thousands of nodes and uh, I think they found the tools really useful so I'm optimistic. So how about this tool then? <laughs> <laughs> I see one more question coming up, great. Um, great talk first. Thank you. And I have a question about uh, debugging uh, in this context. I mean from my point of view having a sidecar container it provides isolation also in terms of the bugging, meaning if there's an application not working, I can just isolate the problem to the pod and check the logs in the sidecar container. Mm -hmm. How does this look like in a daemon set uh, uh, setup? Because at the end, that's what it is. I mean, I have other, uh, work with other applications which use daemon set, and on average, it's harder to debug from my point of view. Yeah, so um, with Hubble, you can filter your logs down to namespaces or pods or services or, or you know a variety of different you know, layers at which you can uh, filter your logs. You can also export, and when I say logs, they're network flow logs, so it's individual packets. Um, so it gives you a lot of visibility. 
And you can also export those to other tools like a, a, you know, Elastic or a, a Sim and use that to then query you know, specific logs. Okay, and what about the Envoy configuration itself? I mean, sometimes with this, it also goes to that. I mean, that you really the bugging filters or listeners, whatever is created, is that easily easily retrievable as well? I think there could be some work to be done there. Um, for example, at the moment, if there is a problem in the CEC, you won't necessarily know about it when you create the CEC. You'll only see the sort of side effects for it. So I think there is work to be done to improve visibility into, yeah, actually this, this configuration is invalid or it's, it's not going to work. So yeah, I think there is more tooling to build there. Thanks a lot. Last question. Uh, hi, Liz. Hi. Um, so the, the announcement about um, the one proxy, is it one proxy per cluster, one proxy per node? Um, so it's one proxy per node because it runs in the Cilium agent, and we have okay. one proxy per node. I think there may be, um, you know, when we talk about this sort of security model, there may be reasons to explore doing um, one proxy per namespace, for example, mm -hmm. um, and possibly to do with, um, uh, you know, the right abstraction for configuration. Yeah. I haven't seen anything yet that says this is compelling and you must do it per namespace, but we're certainly we're open-minded to that being a, a possibility. Okay, so my, my one question is, what's the guarantee that this is not a single point of failure? Um, if one worker thread of Envoy goes down, how is that not guaranteeing that, you know, other, you're not routing traffic to the rest of your services if one? Um, I think that's a fair comment, and that might be a good reason to have multiple instances. I, I think the, the argument that I've heard normally about that model is, well, you might be running custom, you know, WASM filters or, or whatever in your Envoy, and so they're custom, they might not be very tested or hardened, so things could go wrong. That could be a really good reason to not run that proxy across your whole node, perhaps have a you know, use sidecars for, the, for those particular applications where you need those custom filters that you're not very confident in. I think, you know, there, there will be scope for applying a hybrid of these different models. But I think for the, you know, sort of a 90% use case where people don't need to do anything super custom, they're using kind of pretty standard filters that are very field hardened, then, you know, Mm -hmm. We're talking about something pretty unlikely. Sure. I mean, yeah. CVEs are found in Envoy all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, CVEs are also found in the kernel. So, you know, we have single points of failure per machine that we have to deal with anyway. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the questions. Appreciate it.